This program raises questions. This program is for people who find it hard to trust God. The best answers are wrapped in flesh and blood. My friends, people who are enduring real tragedies every single day. Quadriplegia, muscular dystrophy, stroke, bankruptcy, loneliness, singleness. We're gonna to talk to those very people who have touched my life. What if the disability in God's plan doesn't seem to include a happy ending? I have another friend, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who is a titan of the Christian faith and one of the most respected leaders in Christendom. Dr. Sproul is first and foremost a theologian. His life goal is to study and make known the character of God. He's the author of many books, and whether it's in a small classroom setting or in large conferences, R.C. loves to teach on the doctrines of the Christian faith. I can say he's had a huge impact on my own journey of faith with my disability. However, even for giants of the faith, sometimes God's plan does not seem to include a happy ending because R.C. Sproul is the grandparent of a child with a severe disability. Believe me, his confidence in the sovereignty of God was put to the test when his grandchild was born too. And how he and his family responded is quite a story. I have a father who's known the world around for, for trying to persuade people of the sovereignty of God. And all his convictions in that, in that vein, he poured into me all my life. Now, I like to explain it like this, that anything that happens in this world, God knows. And He knows before it happens. And He has the power to stop it. And insofar He's made that decision to let it happen, He has ordained that it be so. And now God says, here's this challenge. Do you really believe that this is from my hand? When R.C. Jr. and his wife Denise uh, had Shannon, their little girl, she was born with less encephali, which uh, means flat brain, as the brain normally has these uh, uh, ridges and convolutions in it. Hers was missing all of those, and that, of course, is a severe uh, impairment. She can't speak. She uh, isn't potty trained. You know, she has to be fed. Uh, and then also the, the medication to keep her from having the seizures, plus the seizures when they overcome the medication, they all uh, make her a little unsteady on her feet as well. She usually has a real regular menu. Breakfast is almost always oatmeal and yogurt. Lunch or supper she'll have pasta and some baby food, and then the other meal is usually completely baby food. There are physically certain things that are difficult. Um, lifting her for me now is difficult, but there are times when I need to do that um, with getting her into bed or into the van um, or in the tub. And as much as we do try to do together as a family, there are limitations on what she is able to do. And so we can't necessarily take her she has to be tended to, she has to be watched. Shannon is our third oldest child. So since then, we have had four children that have started out smaller than her, who grow bigger than her, and in a manner of speaking, get older than her. But the greatest hardship for me is every day knowing that it's extremely likely that uh, Shannon will go on to her reward before we will. I, mean, I, of course, was deeply concerned as a grandfather and as a father for how my son and his wife were going to be able to handle this uh, very difficult situation. When Shannon was diagnosed, of course, my parents were, they, they love me and they love Shannon and they're very concerned about it. And, and they were trying to probe past my, my tendency toward a sort of stoic response. And they you know, very earnestly, R.C., how, how are you doing? And, and I said to them, I said, you know, I really believe that uh, God has been preparing me for this all my life. Both R.C. and Denise uh, have been uh, 
extremely devoted disciples of Christ for many, many, many years. My son said, we see this as a profound honor that the Lord in his goodness and in his grace would give to us the responsibility of the care of this child. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace. You will, in all sincerity, not just because you're supposed to, but you will, in all sincerity, love all your children the same. But it is the frailness and the weakness that elicits the compassion for these special children. Yeah. Shannon is not just my son and daughter-in-law's daughter. Shannon's my granddaughter and my wife's granddaughter. And, uh, and, and we have a deep, deep commitment to them. We have a wonderful extended family that has you know, been supportive and loving towards all of our children. Her grandparents have just been very giving with their time and concern and affection. And the idea of extended family is kind of like a dinosaur that does, no longer fits in our culture. However, the family is not something that was invented by the culture. This is something that is given by God. It's clear that both R.C. and his son believe that God is in absolute control, that he sovereignly gave Shannon to the family. But to them, it's not a dry academic doctrine. The extent of God's control is not merely a subject for classroom debate. And Shannon, for that matter, is not an <laughs> audiovisual aid of some object lesson. No, rather, for the Sproul family, the sovereignty of God is much more compassionate than that. It's a bridge to understanding something tender and something wonderful about God. The dealing with a child with special needs is not a punishment. Not because God loves me. It's not a punishment because it's not hard. Because she's a joy, she's a gift, she's a blessing. God's sovereignty doesn't, it doesn't admit to degrees. We don't talk about God's being 80% eternal or 80% uh, immutable, or 80% omnipotent. If he were 80% omnipotent, he wouldn't be omnipotent, or 80% omniscient. Now, God is 100% sovereign, even over these tragic things. How else could he make the promise to us? All things work together for good by those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. How can that be true if God's not sovereign over all things? My hope and my confidence is in a God who is sovereign and who cares and who is determined to bring good out of evil and to work all these things together for good. She is uh, a charge for not just the, my wife and I, but to the children as well. They have obligations and responsibilities toward her, but even they, they don't resent this. It's not like they're, they're upset because they'd rather be playing video games or something when they have to feed her. They're very giving, very loving, and, 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 and caring toward her. The love that exudes within that family for this child is, is a remarkable testimony to God. It is a challenge, but it's not, um, it's not a punitive, you know, um, dealing from God's hand where he's trying to punish us. It's been a blessing. God, he doesn't make mistakes. He created Shannon just as he created me and you and my husband. And he intended for her life to be as it is. And it was meant to be a blessing to her and to us. You cannot, in the final analysis, have a synthesis between this world and the things of God. There is an antithesis between naturalism and Christianity, between those who hold to a divinely founded sanctity of human life and those who see life simply as a cosmic accident where human beings have emerged fortuitously from the slime. I know that humanists want to assign human dignity to these biological accidents, 
but they are uh, living on borrowed capital. As Schaefer said, they're like uh, people with both feet planted in thin air. They're on a roller coaster without brakes. Let's face it, let's be honest. If I'm a mistake, if I come from the slime and I'm going to the slime, what difference does it make if I'm a germ, whether black germs or white germs sit in the back of the bus? The idea of human dignity apart from God is simply a delusion. As far back as I can remember, uh, I have been involved in the whole pro-life issue. This has always mattered a great, great deal to me. But when Shannon was diagnosed, this issue about which I was very passionate suddenly became exceedingly uh, personal. Now we're talking about people who are saying about my child, she shouldn't be here. When people look at my granddaughter, they look with a jaundiced eye. Uh, there's a kind of myopia there. All they see is the tragedy. And that's why people from this world will get angry, in fact, say, this child should have been aborted. There's no reason why this child was ever brought into the world. They don't see the image of God in Shannon, but my son sees it, and my daughter-in-law sees it, and the brothers and sisters see it, and I can see it. There is no qualification to the biblical language that says children are a blessing. It doesn't say healthy children are a blessing. It says children are a blessing. I'm sure Shannon has many purposes and the reasons God has placed her here. One of them is just bringing joy to our everyday lives. She brings warmth and love, unconditional love. This is a child made in the image of God. She's a child of God.